All right, in continuing our creature, fantasy creature composite assignment two, we left off with our sketch. I've then added to the sketch the kind of animal reference resources I think might be interesting, like a chameleon head, giraffe horns, cat eyes, squirrel tail, chipmunk back, squirrel legs, red panda paws, red panda mouth. Um, and then whether I can find those things or not, those might change. You want to start searching for your high quality references. I strongly, strongly recommend Pixabay for this over Google Images because you want these references to be sharp, in focus, well lit, and most importantly, enough pixels, big enough. A thousand pixels, which is large in Photoshop, is barely enough for what we're doing. And that's if it's a, a photo that's only the thing you want, right? So especially when it's like, I want to use the back legs of a frog. Photo P is great because I can just search for a frog or a toad and I have like this back leg here and I open it up and I sign in so that I can download the largest format And I'll show you here. And when I open it up and view it at full size, it is so big and sharp that that's going to be plenty good enough resolution for whatever creature I'm creating at 8 by 10 by 300 or more. So Pixabay is great. Also, because we're looking at pictures of animals, to create our animals, you can also blend in some other things in there. Like my idea was to blend in maybe some candy things, like uh, cotton candy or something. But by and large, Pixabay will have it because it's kind of the, the kind of thing amateur photographers and wildlife photographers like to shoot and donate. Now, you do want to be pretty general in your searches. But the good thing is there's only 14 pages of results just for toad. And so if I look for toad eye... I'm going to get a lot fewer than that, and I can limit it just to photos under the type of image, right? But this is important because not only are you look, looking for the subject matter you want, you're looking for the actual direction that matches your sketch. So if my sketch looks like this, I need the head to go in this direction. And so if I want a red panda mouth, I need it to be in three-quarter view looking down a little bit. If I look up red panda, like this mouth doesn't work, this mouth doesn't work, this one works great. It's facing the right direction. Now I can also flip it horizontally if I need to do that, but I'm not going to be able to change the direction of the mouth in any meaningful way. So I need it in the resource. So I have found a bunch of resources. I can always add to it with some more. So the next step, I organize those references into a folder in assignment two. The next step is to make sure that my sketch is digitized, gotten into the computer, so I can post it to Canvas and so I can build my image up with this is the blueprint, and that that sketch is the right pixel dimensions for a finished portfolio print. So just like we did with the landscape, in Photopea, I'm going to use the Move tool, I'm going to use the rulers, and after I've posted my sketch to Canvas, which I already have done, it's right there, then I start gathering references, and now I open up my sketch, even if it's just a, a uh, picture on my phone that I took of it, I open it up in PhotoP, and I'm going to drag the guides using the Move tool to be close around the sketch, not touching it, but just close around. So if we were to make a finished print of our creature, we can ensure that that creature is a good resolution to give us a good quality print at the size we would want. So our default size, our minimum size is always 8 by 10 by 300 pixels per inch. So I'm going to go to image, image size, 
and I'm going to change it from pixels to inches. And right now, this is 1.5 inches by 1.56 inches by 300 pixels per inch. So I want to change that to be 10 by 10.35. So it's at least 8 by 10 by at least 300, but I'm going to put 350 because I like that studio resolution. That means I could print it a little bit bigger if I want to. I leave all the other defaults. It's going to resample, bilinear. Remember, it's inches, not pixels. And even though I sketched this digitally, it is going to soften my edges, right? Because that's growing a lot of pixels, just like we did for our landscape. Now, let me go ahead and flatten all of this, just because I drew it digitally. So I'm going to go to Layer, Flatten Image. Now I'm going to grow some working space around it, just like we did for our landscape, like the desktop on which we arrange our collage. So I go to Edit. Sorry, I go to Image, Canvas Size. I'm going to change the canvas size in inches to 30 by 40 inches. And let it grow from the middle. Then it looks like this. Then because that checkerboard of empty space is a little hard to look at, I'm going to create a new layer. And I'm going to say edit fill with gray at 100%. And then I'm going to move that behind my background. All right. And then I can padlock that as well so I don't accidentally mess with it. Now that that's done, I can turn off my guides and I can start bringing in my references. And my references should be bigger than what I need or the size that I need. If they're substantially smaller than what I need, I need to find bigger references because this is our print resolution. The focal point of a character is always the head. And I have a little presentation here that can help. So if you go to the assignment sheets and you scroll to assignment two, just like we had a professional process exploration for landscape, here's one for creature design. And this is RJ Palmer who actually does professional uh, creature concept design and at the time of this presentation, which was uh, created by a student, and then I, with their help, kind of modified it into this. They were the lead concept artist and creature creator for the uh, Pikachu Pokemon detective movie. So they have a history of turning kind of Pokemon into believable 3D elements, right? Like that. So doing exactly what we're doing, especially if we are influenced by Pokemon, right? But any kind of imaginative drawing. So the important thing, like R.J. Parmar shows in, in his process, is it all starts from the skeleton. If you understand where the joints are, where the rigid parts are and the flexible parts, the flexible parts being the spine at the neck and the waist and the tail and the joints like the shoulders, the knees, the hips, the wrists, uh, then you are able to hang different substances on this and they'll be believably a creature that can move and have agency. He did this first with kind of dinosaur designs and really like built it up from the anatomy, understanding the muscle structure. And so this is something we keep in mind, even on top of our most basic sketches. Now, if you're going to have something like this, which is really common in fantasy and never at all present in reality, where you have four separate limbs and wings, then you need a separate structure skeletally for the extra muscles that are required to move those wings. Like birds have huge breast bones and huge breast muscles. That's what we eat when we eat turkey and chicken because those wings take a lot of muscle to move. So if you're also gonna have arms, notice how there's a separate collarbone just for the arms 
and separate musculature underneath that besides the breastbones for these wings. So wings should always come out basically where the shoulder blades would be. They replace the shoulder blades in this case. And that will make them believable. And we're living in an age where we have very believable dragon design <laughs> because it follows those rules. And that didn't used to always be the case. All right. Almost every fantasy creature is based on just a combination of things that exist. Like horny toads and flowers for Bulbasaur. Like cockroaches and beetles <laughs> for H.R. Geiger's uh, alien designs that are, are redone as digital art here. And if they are, really exist, we can steal from those textures and those, those materials from real life and composite something that's more believable. But it takes a lot of different references, right? So... That's why we always find more references than we might actually use. And sometimes we get surprised by references. I was surprised by how many chameleon references Pixabay had and how expressive and sharp these are. And chameleons are great because they have so much space given to each feature of their face, right? To the eyes, to the nose, to the mouth. They're a great kind of structure to build on. So. As I bring that in, I can immediately use the skills we've learned, control T. And it's okay if I have to grow it a little bit, but I don't want to have to grow it a lot because I'll lose some resolution when I do. And I can kind of think, is that the right angle for my sketch? And it is. It could be looking a little bit more down, but I'm going to be using different eyes. And so instead of building the head on top of my sketch, I'm going to build it off to the side. And I think of the analogy of, of putting a car together. If you're building a car, you don't just make a big pile of parts and then just start welding it together. You first build the engine because the engine takes a lot more care and careful machining to get that working. And then once the engine works, you, you bolt that into the chassis of the car, which is the main structure. So the head is going to be the engine of our character. That's where we want to put a lot of our focus. And once we're done with the head, then we'll bring it onto our sketch. Our sketch is the chassis. And then we rough bolt the other pieces onto it. But the head is the focal point of the character. If that works, the rest of the character is likely to work. If the head doesn't work, then we don't have the skills yet to make a believable full creature. So I'm going to use this as the basis. And then I wanted the mouth and ears to come from this red panda resource which is already about the right size. I'll just put it off to the side for now. And then I wanted, let's see, the eyes to come from this cat because red panda and, and uh, chameleon eyes are pretty dead looking, but these eyes are nice and multicolored and have a nice little highlight in there. Even though there is a little bit of digital distortion to this, that's because it was taken in low light and that's called an ISO um, digital distortion from forcing more light into the image. And then let's see, but it should work fine for the eyes. I think that's every, oh, the horns and the nostrils I want to take from this giraffe. So I can shrink that down a little bit. Now you can see all of these are slightly different lighting. Some are warmer, some are cooler, some are um, indoors, some are outdoors. But the first thing I want to do before I fine tune and make everything match and kind of polish everything is I just want to rough select and paste them together. So if this is the, the base of my head, whatever the back of the head is should be your base because it shows how the cranium connects into the neck. And that's what I'm using from this. That should be on the bottom. And then you should put uh, kind of the top of the head on top of that. So I wanted to grab the horns from here. So I'm going to rough cut them out 